Hello, and welcome to our first lecture in what is, I believe, Africa's first smallholder biology soil class. It's good to have you here. In this lecture, we shall be discussing soil and creating a common understanding of what we mean when we use the term soil. What is soil? Conventional description of soil is a medium of sand, silt and clay particles. Sand is considered the largest of soil particles, followed by silt particles which are medium in size, and finally clays which are considered the smallest particles. Soil types differ in their ratios of sand, silt and clay. They have different names as well as different temperaments when faced with similar external forces. As an example, a soil that has a high clay ratio to sand and silt will behave differently when water is applied in the form of rain or irrigation than a medium with less clay and a higher ratio of sand. Water passes easily through sandy soils, but slowly through predominantly clay soils. Soils have a multitude of minerals and in 2003, a study of the world's soils was pub published by Sparks. This study showed that soils all over the world, no matter where they're from, had an abundance of minerals, more than enough for billions of years of vigorous crop production. The good news then is that soils don't lack minerals. Why then are we using synthetic fertilizers to grow our food if our soils have an abundance of minerals? The problem is that these minerals are not present in a plant available format. This means that plants can't access them. We should ask ourselves how plants dominated the planet before us if they couldn't access the minerals. And when we do this, we'll begin to question what it is that's enabled plants to access these minerals for the past few million years without the need of our synthetic fertilizers. Hmm. Let's look at what plants need to grow. We know they need water, carbon dioxide and sunlight, and that they use these through a process called photosynthesis. We also know that they need minerals. How have they been getting this stuff? And where we're not farming plants, for example, in forests, how are they doing it? Let's have a look at some data from Dr. David Johnson. Dr. Johnson is a molecular biologist conducting research as a research scientist at the Institute for Sustainable Agricultural Research at New Mexico State University and an adjunct professor at the Center for Regenerative Agriculture and Resilient Systems at California State University. Dr. Johnson did an experiment to find out which nutrients were responsible for high yields in crops. He grew crops using 10 different types of compost and then he tracked the growth of the crops and compared them with the different mineral nutrients. He thought the biggest contributor to crop yield would be nitrogen. His results showed, however, that the nitrogen quantities didn't affect crop growth as expected. As you can see from the graph, the highest growth was achieved in the, in the first two samples. However, they had the lowest levels of nitrogen. Samples four and five had the highest levels of nitrogen, yet their yields were nothing to write home about. The same example was carried out checking for potassium. Again, the results showed that the highest yields were not related to higher levels of potassium. Intrigued with these results, Dr. Johnson did the same with phosphorus and he found high levels of phosphorus didn't relate to high yields either. Finally, he looked at organic matter but here too, the results didn't tally with the thinking of increased mineral nutrients improving crop yields. Finally, he looked at the microbes. What he found was that the fungal bacterial ratio seemed to definitely influence crop yields and more so than minerals. This discovery led to new research and underpinned some of the science around regenerative agriculture today. What it showed is that microbes in the soil are massively important, yet they've been overlooked for years. So what are bacteria and fungi? In the world of soils, they're microorganisms in the soil, part of a massive community of microorganisms, so micro 
that they can't be seen with the naked eye. They can only be seen through a microscope using shadowing techniques to see the microbes that have the same colour of water as water. Soil is teeming with microbial life. One could argue that soil is alive and connected across this entire planet. There are billions of bacteria and fungi in one teaspoon of soil. And there is so much that we don't know about the abundant life in soils other than that it's vital to our life. So what do bacteria and fungi do in the soil? Like us on the planet, they're trying to live a healthy and fulfilling life before they succumb to the overall sum of the nutrients that they're made up of, much the same way as we are really. And in the process of living, they're also converting minerals and other nutrients into plant soluble forms. Thus, they have a life supporting relationship with plants. They're also a tasty meal for other microbes to feed on them. And when eaten, their nutrients pass up the food web when those that eat them are eaten themselves, or when they die, or when they poop, in the continuous cycle of predator eating prey. There are gazillions, billions of microscopic creatures in the ground going through this cycle every second of every night. That's wow. In the soil food web, bacteria and fungi are the most abundant and they can be beneficial as well as not so beneficial. There are disease causing microorganisms. However, in a well-balanced soil food web and through consumption, inhibition and competition, the bad guys are always kept under control. So as long as microbes are there in the soil, the sand, silt and the clay minerals will be metabolized into soluble plant available forms. So how do plants get the minerals they need? Plants are clever. They grew up with soil microbes and developed wonderful relationships. Just like you and I, plants need different nutrients as they grow. Their diets change too but they're a little stuck in the mud. They can't walk, nor can they produce enzymes to extract minerals from sand, silt and clays, but they really, they need the nutrients close to their roots so that they can access them. And they want these little nutritious microbes as close as possible to their roots, right? So they bribe them. We know plants use CO2, sunlight and water, to produce their simple sugars and carbohydrates in a process called photosynthesis. But did you know they pump 40% of this sweet photosynthate down into the ground and out through their roots as sweet exudates? They do this to keep the microbes happy, like a bartender who needs to keep his bar full. So every often he announces, happy hour, free drinks, and his customers come running. We all like sweet stuff, and so do the microbes. They love it. So they look after the plant and provide her what she wants in exchange for those sweet ex exudates. They do this by producing glues that help them to stick around. These glues begin to form aggregates, soil aggregates, and these soil aggregates lead to soil integrity. These glues begin to stick other bits of material together and begin to create stable aggregates. And in turn, soil integrity makes it capable of withstanding the soil, capable of withstanding heavy showers and storms, and even compaction. The microbes create stability through the soils for themselves and the plants so that they both thrive. As the soil microbes build structure, air passages are formed ensuring the soil stays aerated, nutrients are held, water is retained, and it moves slowly through the soil. The soil holds the water at depth, and the water that moves into the underground sources is filtered through the stable organic matter, where toxins are removed and neutralized by the microbes, resulting in clean water reaching groundwater catchments like wells, dams, rivers, lakes, and the sea. Soils without microbes become compact 
as the soil sands, as the sands, silt and clay particles collapse upon each other. They are in fact dirt. Any nutrients simply wash away. Particles are easily eroded. Water catchments are muddy and full of leached nutrients and begin to turn toxic, poisoning life in the waterways and beyond. Sadly, this is the state of most of our agricultural soils in Kenya today. But now that we know about microbes, the good news is that we can fix this. To begin with, we need to find out exactly where we are. So what do we call sand, silt and clay that doesn't have organic matter or microbes? Is it soil? Does it have aggregates and integrity? What happens when it rains? Does your soil have integrity? What happens when it rains? Are you cultivating soil or dirt? We should be sharing a video on the soil integrity test after this session today and would like you all to watch the video and do the test at home. This will help you assess your soils. Your homework is to do the test and share a video of yourself doing it with your family as well as your farming community. We look forward to watching your videos in the WhatsApp group. So take your videos and post them to the WhatsApp group. The Soil Advocate mentors, myself and Team Ica will be there to help you, to guide you, to correct you, to learn from you. Thank you for joining today. We look forward to our second session next week where we'll be discussing your results from your test.